left. Okay. Okay, Melanie, it's all yours. All righty, thank you very much. So welcome everybody. I'm glad that uh, you all showed up tonight, that you weren't too busy and you're uh, ready to hear a really good lecture tonight on uh, some geology in the national parks. But this is our 90th, 99th episode. So our mm -hmm. Zoom rock room is gonna be number 100. So it's gonna be a big deal. <laughs> uh, so of course, we are sponsored by Lair Architecture um designing for the future so again reach out uh their their email is listed there uh and of course dirtman's rock room or dirtman's reports on youtube uh, all of his videos are uploaded there so check them out if you haven't uh seen any previous videos of his they're always great they're always funny they're always educational and i think after i'm done this intro uh he's going to be showing us a new video tonight so feel free to check that out later on. All right. So we also have some geology programs coming up this spring in 2023. Uh, there looks like there's two in May, one on May 4th at 7 p.m. What's on the other side of the mountain? And on May 6th, there is an all-day bus trip for uh, York County. Okay, and of course the Appalachian Trail hiking um, is through February 26th at 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And Jerry, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is through the Institute out in Waynesboro. Yep. All right. Uh -huh. Crystal Cove Collective with Michael Pinky and Christo Wetterhall uh, out in Camp Hill, another one of our sponsors. Yeah. If you're not muted, you want to get yourself there, please. Uh... Okay. There we go. Uh, Maple Sugaring Days, if you're in the York County area and you're looking for something to do uh, in the next few weeks, the last weekend in February and the first weekend in March, uh, at Nixon County Nature Center. Uh, I'm coordinating it, this, this special event this year. We're gonna have a lot of special displays and exhibits outside and inside the Nature Center. So even if it's gonna be chilly, there's still gonna be a break, there's stuff inside, there'll be food and beverage inside, there'll be historical displays, modern day displays. So if you have any grand, grandchildren or children or just want you know, to get out of the house for an hour or two, uh, feel free to stop by Nixon Park for that special event. It should be great, hopefully. <laughs> Archaeology Week is always a big hit. It's for ages 9 through 12 and it is at uh, Cadoris State Park. So it looks like you do have a QR code there if you want to register uh, prior. And if not, you have any follow-up questions about Archaeology Week, feel free to reach out to Jerry. He can give you all the more uh, further details on this program if you have any. Always popular, always a big hit. And of course, our coming up our schedule, feel free to take a picture of this, um, screenshot it on your phone, laptop, computer, save these dates, write them down quick if you need to. Um, our next one, February 21st, is our 100th episode, so hopefully we have um, some fun stuff planned for you guys for that 100th episode to make it kind of memorable, and we'll be talking about the prehistory along the Little Schuylkill River in PA. After that, we're already into March, so March 7th, John Day Fossil Beds National Monument is going to be the topic of that night. After that, March 21st, we're going to be talking about Punctuated Tectonic Equilibrium with Greg Herman, which should be very interesting. And then we're already well on our way into spring uh, in April, April 4th. The 18th century Mary Ann Furnace will be the top topic of that uh, Zoom Rock Room. And then lastly, April 18th, Rock Hounding 101 with Jerry and myself. All right, so I kept talking about this, the 99th episode. The next episode is going to be the 100th. 
uh, Zoom rock room, which is, like I said, it's going to be exciting. Hopefully we can make it a little fun for you guys virtually. Uh, but we want to see your either homemade creations uh, to wear any like a hundred, you know, glasses, funny hats. Uh, if you could find a fun 100th uh, background uh, or other fun uh, props, backgrounds, things like that uh, to make it to make it goofy, to make it fun, to make it memorable, that would be fantastic. And then lastly, we were um, we introduced this a few weeks ago on the Zoom Rock Room, but introducing the information please hotline if you have any of your geological questions that you're really, really curious about, that you don't know too much about, but you want uh, to be informed, you want to be educated, uh, please contact or use this email um, that is underlined there in blue, and hopefully we can get a response for you by the next uh, Zoom Rock Room. Right, and I think that's everything for the intro. So, Andrew, you are more than welcome to uh, take over and and share your latest video with us. Thanks, Melanie. Sure. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Next rock room is going to be awesome. I'm already creating something awesome that's going to be impactful and memorable and funny. So uh, that's going to be great stuff. This Dirtman report should air during that report during that uh, episode, but uh, I already have something for that episode. So this is going to air tonight. Uh, for those who follow me on the socials, uh, you may have seen the gavels travels from when I filmed this. Uh, if not. This will be new for you, but uh, uh, th this was something that I wasn't really, I didn't really know about prior to a month and a half ago and kind of stumbled upon it, wanted to go look at it and little uh, behind the scenes fact before I hit play here. Uh, in fact, in this scene that you see here, uh, you may see some flashing yellow and red lights because I was actually standing at the water's edge below uh, the dam, the Holtwood Dam, while it was, the alerts were going off and you're not supposed to be there. So I filmed this whole thing when I wasn't supposed to be there. <laughs> <laughs> at the water's edge while the water was coming up. Yeah, so here you go. Without further ado. <laughs> Give me one second just to select this here. All right, everybody, here we go. Durman here with another special report. This time from one of the oldest rivers in the world. Estimated to be up to 325 million years old and draining an area of over 27,500 square miles from Cooperstown, New York and Pittsburgh, PA down to the Chesapeake Bay. The mighty Susquehanna River is the longest river in the U.S. today without commercial shipping traffic. But prior to the 1900s, that wasn't the case. Native American petroglyphs found throughout the Susquehanna are evidence of the earliest travelers of this waterway. However, from early European settlers through 1800s America, moving goods along the Susquehanna with boats, rafts, and arcs successfully proved to be a great challenge. So, in 1836, Baltimore and Philadelphia merchants got together and started a $3.5 million fight with the geology of the Susquehanna River, bypassing 45 miles from Harvardy Grace, Maryland to Wrightsville, PA, with the Susquehanna and Tidewater Canal. This is Lock 12, at 17 foot wide and 170 foot long, with a lift capacity of 8.8 .8 feet it's one of the 28 locks constructed to overcome the 230-foot rise of elevation during that 45-mile journey. Beautiful Octoraro Formation Schist was used to build these locks, making upstream transportation of loads of 150 tons or more possible when it opened in 1840. A flood of pig iron, coal, grain, and more now floated up and down the Susquehanna River successfully. But it wasn't for long. By the 1890s, abundant railroad competition 
and damaging floods had taken their toll on the canal, and operations ceased. Over a hundred years later, geology has reclaimed most of the remaining canal, where water from dam construction hasn't covered it and the many Native American petroglyphs that preceded it. Today, you too can visit the beautifully restored Lock 12 and the abandoned Lock 13 on the western bank of the Susquehanna River in York County, below the Holtwood Dam in the Lock 12 recreational area along the Route 372 bridge. I'm Durman, bringing the geology to you from here on the Susquehanna River and the Susquehanna and Tidewater Canal. Back to you, Jerry. All right. Great job, Andrew. That was a, of course, I always love the river and a lot of history there. And of course, the geology itself and everything else. So uh, before we get into our program, I just want to uh, give a little editorial comment here about the uh, program we did three weeks ago with groundwater. I, uh, I may have misled you, first of all, on the first slide where I showed you the division of a percentage of uh, fresh water in, on the earth. And uh, that particular slide left out the saltwater uh, branch part of it. So uh, I just want to reconfirm to you that 97% uh, of the water on the earth is actually salt water, and 3% is fresh water. Uh, either in the ground, the icebergs, uh, fresh water, you know, ponds, whatever. So I just want, didn't want to mislead you that uh, fresh water was the most abundant type, of, was the most abundant water uh, on Earth. And secondly, uh, I stressed uh, that uh, limestone was a is a good filter of groundwater for contaminants. Uh, it really is not as much as I let, let it on to, to believe that. So uh, uh, just uh, if you, you can use lime in your water, but uh, if your water is going through limestone, it's not necessarily a, a cleanup, uh, automatic cleanup of any contaminants. So, okay. Um, I usually start out with uh, with some jokes, you know, in, early in the show, but since since Mel uh, had the intro tonight, um, we're going to uh, give you a couple of jokes now. For example, and I'm I'm uh, I'm centered on computers tonight. You know, we all live have to live with computers, and hopefully they all do work when they need to work. But uh, a customer had called a a co computer store and said, uh, "My computers tell me." When I tried to print, it says, can't find printer. And this customer said, I even put the, took the printer and sat it in front of the monitor. And the computer still says, I can't find the printer. So she was a little confused with that, right? Uh, sort of thing. Um, also, um, uh, customer says, my keyboard is not working anymore. And the tech support person, are you sure it's plugged into the computer? Customer said, no, I can't get behind the computer. Tech support says, pick up your keyboard and walk 10 paces back. And the customer did that, okay. Did the keyboard come with you? Customer said, yes. That means the keyboard's not plugged in. And finally, uh, I can't get on the internet said the customer to the tech support person. Tech support said, are you sure you use the right password? Customer said, yes, I'm sure. I saw my colleague do it. Tech support, can you tell me what your password was? Customer said, five dots. So, you know, another one that I didn't have written down tonight, but I, I also read it a long time ago that a person bought a uh, a computer and this is one of the older models when they uh when they used to put the cd rom in hor and uh, horizontally instead of vertically like a lot of computers now and this uh, person new to the computer she 
opens her CD-ROM and saw the hole there. And she thought it was a, cu a cup holder. You know, she didn't know what it was for. And uh, she actually called the com 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 computer company and said, thanks for putting this cup holder on this computer. It took them a little while to figure out what, what, what that was all about. So anyway. <laughs> all right. Um, so it's really an honor tonight to have uh, have our speaker joining us tonight. I've been looking forward to this uh, this one for a while because uh, Vince and I have uh, seen each other a couple times, both times at the uh, on the Gettysburg National Military Park. Uh, Vince uh, Vince and I actually she uh, had had a uh, had a uh, same friend named Dr. Roger Cuffey from. Penn State, who actually uh, invented and wrote the uh, the geologic guide to the National Park at Gettysburg, and uh, we went on his trips a couple times. But anyway, uh, Vincent L. Santucci is the senior paleontologist and paleontology program coordinator for the United States Park Department, uh, the Park Service. And beginning in 1985, Vince has held Assignments at Badlands, Petrified Forest, Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, Fossil Butte, Tall Springs, Fossil Beds, and other national parks, as well as supported geology and paleontology projects in over 280 national park areas. Vince has been a leader for paleontological resource management protection, education, stewardship, and science in the United States, and has published more than 280 articles and reports related to the National Park Service paleontology. Vince was inter instrumental in establishing the National Fossil Day, which is the, in October during Earth Science Week. Started that in 2009 and is a recipient of various honors and awards including the Brunton Compass, the George Wright Nat Natural Re uh, Resource, Leave No Trace Leader Award, and the George Hartzog Stewardship Award. And tonight, Vince is gonna talk about the preservation of, of uh, fossils in the national parks and anything else that he can think of. So Vince, pleasure to have you here tonight. And I'm really, really looking forward to your program. It's all yours. Well, thanks, Jerry. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to present tonight on one of my favorite topics, and that is fossils from the national parks. Um, I I really feel privileged and think I I've got you know a tremendous job and responsibility, and uh, I have the opportunity to get out into the field quite a bit uh, to assist parks with the. Uh, management and protection of fossils. Um, sometimes it involves research, sometimes it involves uh, other kinds of activities as well. But uh, I'm duty stationed out of Washington, D.C., the main interior building, but I call home uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And so, uh, again, thanks for the opportunity to speak. So let's see if, if this will work, if I share my screen. Are you seeing the, the main slide, Jerry? You're good. Okay, very good. I'm going to probably turn off my camera. I hope that doesn't shut things down. There you go. Uh, it's very distracting to see yourself on screen when you're trying to present. So <laughs> anyways, um, so that's our logo for the National Park Service Paleontology Program. And uh, so let's see. Trying to see how to advance the slide on here. There we go. So uh, across the National Park Service, uh, we have identified 284 different national parks that preserve fossils, that we've been able to document them. And you can see that they're spread across you know, uh, areas around Washington, D.C. and across the Midwest, um, heavy concentration of parks on the Colorado Plateau, 
um, along the west, western Pacific coast and in Alaska as well. And what's nice is that it provides you an opportunity to look at a, a, an incredible cross section of paleontological resources spanning you know, almost 2 billion years of earth history. And so we, we have parks like Glacier National Park, which preserves some of the oldest kinds of fossils, these algal stromatolites high in, in, the, uh, in the Rocky Mountains. And that spans all across geologic time, every major stage of evolutionary history, um, all the way up through Pleistocene and Holocene, uh, fossils that are found in caves in Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, Carlsbad Caverns, Mammoth Cave, and elsewhere. And so in terms of uh, the diversity of living things, uh, we, we run the gamut and help to preserve the paleontological heritage of North America uh, through the work that goes on within the national parks. <clears throat> the national park system also uh, manages the National Natural Landmarks Program and the National Historic Landmarks Program. And in fact, 74 of the National Natural Landmarks are primarily set up because of paleontological themes. And 32 uh, National Historic Landmarks uh, are tied to some story in paleontology. So for example, in Philadelphia, uh, there's a famous paleontologist that lived during the last part of the 19th century. Uh, that was uh, Edward Drinker Cope, and his home is preserved as one of the National Historic Landmarks. The National Park Service uh, manages over 645,000 fossil specimens that have been collected through research and other activities. Uh, the, uh, the largest repository with National Park Service specimens is the Smithsonian in Washington, DC but we've identified about 195 different museum institutions across the United States and, and around the world uh, that actually preserve cataloged fossil specimens that come from national park areas. Uh, holotype specimens are really important specimens in the science of paleontology. Holotype specimens are the specimens that were used to describe and define new taxa, new gen genera and species in the fossil record. And so that when, whenever a new holotype is defined, um, there are certain rules in terms of taxonomic nomenclature that are required to name a new genus species of fossil. And generally it includes a very detailed description which identifies those features that set it apart from every other known fossil that are distinctly unique that allow it to be uh, defined as a new species. And of course that has to be published in, in a peer reviewed scientific journal and it has to be assigned a unique name to it. And so from national park areas, there are over 2200 holotype specimens uh, from the fossil record that have been discovered in parks. Therefore, we, we believe that work, paleontological work in national parks is extremely important and it has contributed significant to our understanding of the fossil record. One of the big things that we do is called paleontological resource inventory. And so what inventory is, as we define it, it's the identification of the scope, the significance, the distribution, both geographic distribution and temporal distribution, so over geologic time, as well as the management issues associated with fossils that come from national parks. Um, we've expanded the list of parks with fossils uh, from just 12 parks in 1985 to, we actually have 284 parks. I need to update this because last week we discovered a new park that we've added to our list. Uh, this inventory work is mandated by law, and it's certainly rewarded us with some tremendous new discoveries by getting out there in the field and doing inventories of parks to identify these resources. The Paleontological Resources Preservation Act was, uh, was enacted into law by Congress in 2009. And one of the sections of it, section 6302 in the legislation, 
you can see specifically references inventory and monitoring as important requirements in terms of the management of fossils uh, on National Park Service and other federal lands. So I began this effort of documenting fossils in national parks back starting in 1985. So, you know, I, I think that part of your audience probably weren't even around in 1985, uh, but I began my career in Badlands National Park. And in 1985, the National Park Service hosted its first fossil conference at Dinosaur National Monument. And they brought in some big wig that obviously was paid more than they were worth from Washington to come in and be the keynote speaker. And when he mentioned that he was proud that we had 12 parks in the national park system with fossils, most of the paleontologists in the audience looked at each other and thought, wow, how does he not know this? Um, this guy's getting paid more than he's worth. And so at, at that point, I began to document through inventory how many other national parks had fossils? And you can see the steady growth over time through doing inventories to where we are now with 284 parks. The idea is that if the parks don't even know that they have fossils, how are they managing? How are they protecting? How are they making decisions when they have to put a new road or trail in uh, without knowing that there's fossils there? They obviously could threaten or impact those non-renewable resources by not knowing. So inventory to contribute that knowledge is an important part of, of what we do in our, our National Park Service paleontology program. And so here you can see examples of various parks where we've been involved in doing baseline paleontological resource inventories. And of course, you know, it's, it's, not, it, it's not bad to be able to go to a, a beautiful place like Yellowstone National Park and spend a few weeks you know, uh, getting paid for it to do inventories. When we did our first inventory for Colonial National Historical Park in Virginia, not a park that you right off the top of your head would think is a fossil park. It's mostly known for its historic uh, resources that we began to, to find references uh, to fossils that were collected by individuals that were crossing the Atlantic Ocean from Europe back in the 1600s. And these people that were coming across uh, on boats, uh, some of them were brought to the, to the New World to be able to do surveys along the coastline so that they can develop shipping ports and, and docks uh, for the incoming boats that were coming from Europe. Some of the people that, that traveled back and forth across the Atlantic realized that there were people back in Europe, these private collectors mostly, and some scientists who would pay big money for, to bring back you know, natural or cultural objects that they can add to their collect, personal collections or museums. And so if you're looking down on the bottom right-hand side, you'll see uh, a specimen of a pectin, a, a shell, that was collected in the um, 1600s, late 1600s, taken back to a collector by the name of Martin Lister. And Martin Lister, Lister uh, published in 1687, a report on this fossil from the coastline in Virginia, this, this pectin specimen. And it turns out what's interesting about that is that this is the first fossil ever published on and figured from what will become the United States, from North America, from the Western Hemisphere, from the New World. So from doing a lot of research, we found that the first published fossil specimen from anywhere in the Western Hemisphere was from what is now today Colonial National Historic Park. We thought that was interesting just from, from a historical perspective. So as we're getting out there and parks are contacting us and saying, hey, can you help us do a paleontological inventory? We got that email from the staff at Mammoth Cave and said, when can you come and help us out? And so when we came there, we figured, well, they probably already know most of what there is to know about the park. And, and largely it was based upon ice age or Pleistocene mammals that are, are known and documented from the cave. But when we started looking in the 
the limestones that the cave was formed in, we were finding all of these beautiful corals and echinoderms like crinoids and shark's teeth. And so it turns out we brought a, sh a shark tooth expert from these late Paleozoic beds. And his name is J.P. Hodnett. Uh, he's from Maryland. And he just immediately uh, was, was excited. And it turns out that now that we brought J.P. into this project, uh, we have identified almost 100 different species of, of Mississippian age shark five of which are brand new to science. And so they will be described and published and eventually become holotype specimens. So this turned out to be a real panacea. We created this painting um, based on a depiction of, of the fossils that were documented uh, as part of this inventory. This painting was done by a famous uh, artist named of Julius Sistoni. Uh, he, he's known for uh, the paintings that he created in the Smithsonian's new fossil hall. He's also probably more well known because he's the artist that created the Tyrannosaurus Rex stamps that the US Postal Service issued. Yellowstone National Park is, is one of my favorite places and there's a, there's a rich history um, that dates back to even prior to when it was established as a national park area um, in 1872. And so the earliest reference to fossils from Yellowstone National Park are attributed uh, to uh, a mountain man you've probably heard of by the name of Jim Bridger. And Jim Bridger was out across the American West as a fur trader. And, you know, a lot, he spent a lot of time alone out there. And uh, whenever he got together at these mountain man rendezvous, he'd always be uh, very popular because of all these tall tales and stories that he could tell around the campfire. And one of the stories that, is, that has been passed down from Jim Bridger is his story about, well, he talked about a mountain of glass. And today we know that mountain of glass actually exists as the obsidian cliffs. And he talked about these hot, colorful jets of water that would spray from the ground. And he talked about these petrified birds singing petrified songs and petrified trees. And of course, many people just laughed and thought, you know, mountain man Jim Bridger's crazy. He was out in the wilderness a little too long. But it turns out that um, a very important individual by the name of Ferdinand Hayden, who was a Civil War veteran, but he was also trained as a geologist and paleontologist, was very interested when he met with Jim Bridger. And it drew him to want to develop a a survey to go into the Yellowstone Basin and actually see if there are these hot fountains of colorful water that were shooting from the ground and if there was a mountain of glass and to see if these petrified trees actually exist. And so you probably know that in 1871, Ferdinand Hayden led an expedition into Yellowstone that made lots of discoveries. They reported on um, Old Faithful and named many of the sites. And he, when, when Hayden came back, he and his colleagues that were scientists published a report and made recommendations to Congress. And it wound up resulting in Congress passing uh, legislation to create Yellowstone National Park as the first national park in 1872. So I'm gonna share with you some top secret information. I'm gonna trust that, that everybody will, will take the pledge not to share this secret because we haven't published on it yet. But we're back in Yellowstone. We were back in Yellowstone last year for the 150th anniversary of Yellowstone National Park. And we brought a team of paleontologists. And one of the, the new discoveries that we made are dinosaurs. Dinosaurs in Yellowstone. Now, if you put Yellowstone and dinosaurs into the same sentence, uh, you've got a pretty hot topic. And not only do we have dinosaurs in Yellowstone, but we found a cousin to the Tyrannosaur. Um, it's not Tyrannosaurus rex as the species, but it's a cousin, it's a related Tyrannosaurus, Tyrannosaur that we found in Cretaceous rocks within Yellowstone. So I'm trusting you won't share that information too widely, uh, but we're, we're going to be publishing on that uh, this upcoming year. I don't know if you, anybody has heard about the, the findings that we've had in White Sands National Park. 
And so White Sands is known as this very beautiful white gypsum rich sand, sand dunes. And it turns out that about 15 years ago, a, a new employee was hired. And as he was documenting through LIDAR and air photos, the shifting white sand dunes, they, they shift constantly because of prevailing winds, et cetera, that he found that beneath the, the, the sand dunes, there are these ice age Playa Lake deposits. And because he had a good eye for things, he started seeing things uh, that he thought were uh, footprints of Ice Age mammals. And so I'll, I'll never forget the day that he called me and said, hey, I'd like to email you some photos. I think we've got fossil footprints here. And when I opened up his email, I could tell immediately that he in fact was right and that there were these Ice Age footprints. So. Uh, if you look at the the photos on the the right hand side, the top foot the top print is of a ground sloth uh, that lived during the ice age. They went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene. There's only two localities in, in the United States that preserve um, sloth footprints. One is in Carson City, Nevada, and the second is at White Sand. We have found hundreds of sloth prints, and so very exciting find. You can see a cat print. That's a large cat print. Um, lion type uh, animal that uh, left the prints there in the Playa Lake. But what became very problematic is we started finding these bipedal footprints uh, that look like human footprints. And we're thinking, okay, these are in the same units as Ice Age animals. You know, we want to be cautious because, you know, the archaeologists, if you start talking about human occupation of the New World, older than 13,000 years ago, you get a lot of people getting angry with you. And, and it, you know, every archeological textbook will, will tell you that humans came into the new world no earlier than 13,000 years ago. So if you haven't read the news, Google um, fossil human tracks from White Sands National Park. We knew that this was gonna be a controversial issue. So we were very cautious before we reported but we brought in teams of, of paleontologists, geologists, archaeologists from around the world to come in here to look at this and to do age dating, carbon-14 dating. And we have been able to confirm that we have human footprints in White Sands National Park that extend back to between 21,000 and 23,000 years ago. So when we first reported this, a lot of people threw tomatoes at us and lots of other things and some, and some very mean words. Uh, but after we published our most recent paper uh, that we, all, we began to get more and more support of people that bought into the traditional view that, that there's no occurrence of humans older than 13,000 years ago. And so there are still some naysayers out there, but I think the science uh, that has been put forth is, is very, very reliable. And I think that uh, there's more to be reporting because we've now been looking at older units that are below the 23,000 horizon and we're finding more human footprints. So stay tuned, there's more to be learned from White Sands. Here's um, a, a really interesting, it's a, it's a LIDAR uh, of a fossil trackway. Uh, you can see the bipedal human footprints. And I'll never forget on um, April 21st of 2018, the day that we published our first article in, in science on the discovery of these human footprints, that we went out in the field in the afternoon. And that was the day that I, I uncovered the first human toddler footprint, probably around two to three years old. And so uh, we found hundreds since this first one, but it was a day that I, you know, when I'm down there looking at this little footprint, thinking, oh, this can't be true, that I kept my, I, I held my breath as I continued to, to try to document it and, and, and expose it. And I couldn't help just thinking of my granddaughter at that time, Lily, who was three years old. 
and thinking if this is a human footprint from the late Pleistocene, that's going to be a very important find. And it turns out that, you know, there's no question that we have children's footprints. And it's, it's funny that now that we've been documenting them and finding them, we're finding them running in circles, we're finding them jumping in mud and doing the normal things that any three-year-old would do. And uh, so uh, I think that I, I just wanted to share one last point about that is that, you know, this represents living human beings from our past that, you know, that are, are around well beyond 13,000 years ago into our past. For the local Native Americans in New Mexico, when we brought them out there so that they could experience and see these resources firsthand, when we showed them the toddler footprint of a little three-year-old from the Ice Age, they didn't say a word. The tears that emerged from their eyes spoke for, for how that how important that was to them. So I just want to emphasize that through inventory work, you know, it's it's not just a busy work of documenting things. We're actually making new discoveries um, that profoundly change some of the textbooks in terms of uh, how we've understood things in the past. Another example comes from a, a very important cave in Grand Canyon National Park called Rampart Cave. And so Rampart Cave was, was first excavated during the 1930s. A paleontologist by the name of Remington Kellogg from the Smithsonian was out there. He was able to get support from the Civilian Conservation Corps staff that they completely, or, or they went through the cave and they excavated. They've got ground sloth skeletons, bat skeletons, cat skeletons, all sorts of things it, that are preserved in layers of ground sloth dung. And so you probably see in the front, those are the, the boluses of sloth dung, but there's this stratified sequence that they documented and they, they, they pulled out two, two cat skulls. One was a sub-adult and the other was a juvenile. And that uh, Remington Kellogg reported in his publications that there were mountain lions, there were puma in, in Grand Canyon. And of course the scientific community has believed that in 2019, in celebration of the centennial for Grand Canyon National Park, uh, we did a paleontological inventory for Grand Canyon. And we, when we, back to, we went back to the Smithsonian to look at the Rampart Cave collections, uh, our team looked at the cat skulls and said, these aren't puma skulls. These look like something else. And so after we researched them, uh, we were able to confirm that these two skulls belong to what we refer to as an American cheetah, uh, Miracinonyx, and that's huge. I mean, to the people that, that study carnivores and the fossil record, to have an American cheetah in Grand Canyon is really revolutionary in terms of thinking because the cheetahs are interpreted as open savanna dwellers where they can run down antelope and things like that. And so they're very cursorial. And so finding them in caves in a canyon country is a whole new paleoecological interpretation of, of how these animals live uh, during the ice age. So uh, always fun things to, to discover. I, one last thing from Grand Canyon. Uh, again, the inventories have really rewarded us. So Grand Canyon is an area that there are hundreds of caves in, in some of these limestones and that um, within some of those caves are archeological remains, within some of these caves are paleontological remains. And so uh, we got a report from the cave cavers that had re only recently found a cave system that they had never known about before in a very, very remote part of the park. And the first thing they, they wanted to tell us about is how difficult it was to get into this cave that half the team of very experienced cavers couldn't make it through. And the, and the team that got through, when they came out, they reported a couple of things. One is that they felt with great certainty, based on the resource conditions that they saw, there was nothing to disturb. 
they felt that humans probably have never been in this cave before. That's, that creates a really unique situation where you have undisturbed resources. The second thing that caught our attention is that they said that there were thousands of mummified bats. And so what you're looking at with all the fur on it is that these are bats from the Pleistocene. They first thought, well, maybe there was some sort of mass death that killed all these bats in a, an event like white nose syndrome or something else. But once we started doing radiocarbon dates on these bats, we got a range of ages from 3,500 years ago to 54,000 years ago. Now, what's amazing about that? We can go on all day about that. But one of the things that is really important, and there are about there are seven different species that we have, is that we have a chronology of the Townsend big big uh, big eared bat where they are extant, they live in the canyon today in caves, but we have them going all the way back 54,000 years. And so we now are going through, uh, for each specimen that we're getting a date on, an age of when it lived, we're also gonna start doing ancient DNA analysis. Nowhere on planet Earth is there a source of DNA to be able to look at changes in microgenomic uh, genomes over 50,000 years. So this is gonna be a really important study going forward because we're looking at a very rare kind of resource enabling us the opportunity to make these kinds of uh, observations and measurements. Um, not, not far from here, you're probably familiar with Cumberland, Maryland. Uh, there's a cave that is uh, along uh, what is called the Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail, and it's, it's called the Cumberland Bone Cave. And it was explored and excavated by the Smithsonian around 1915, 1916 time period. But when we were doing research on it, we had gotten rumor that there was a small collection of things that were collected that were never brought to the attention of the Smithsonian or the scientific community. So we went to inventory and lo and behold, there's one incredible specimen on the left. That is a, a brain endocast. It's the infilling of a skull cap where it leaves the impression of what the brain looked like. So it's not the actual brain, it's fine grain sediment that filled up the brain cavity when the when the bone was still there, and it left this impression of the inside of the skull, which essentially shows the, you know, the patterns of the of the ancient brain of this Pleistocene bear cub. It's a young, it's a juvenile. And so, you know, that's a very, very rare specimen. Again, thank goodness we do inventories. So shifting to monitoring, we do inventory and we do monitoring. And so monitoring is different from inventory in that what it does is that we oftentimes leave fossils in situ, in place. We don't collect everything. We just don't have the space in museum cabinets. And sometimes it's not feasible. So for example, at Glen Canyon National Recreation Area where there's Lake Powell, there are huge dinosaur trackways that it wouldn't be feasible to try to collect because you know, they may be 40 feet long and you know, we just don't have the, the ability to collect those easily. And so monitoring is assessing the condition and stability of these fossils that are maintained in situ or in place. That's important because we want to evaluate any sort of natural or human factors that threaten the stability, uh, that threaten th these fossils over time. And so natural processes, you know, weathering, erosion, changing in lake level, submerging sites, the human factors are theft, vandalism, you know, construction without knowing that the fossils are there, et cetera. It's also mandated under federal law, and we've made some really wonderful discoveries in the process of doing monitoring. In 2009, we published uh, a GSA special volume uh, referred to geologic monitoring. And so to the scientific community, um, they, they don't really do monitoring. You know, they want to get out there and find a new dinosaur to put the name on it. Uh, but monitoring is a resource management tool 
that's important to us that are federal land managers that help parks to, to protect resources. And so when we published a, a, a chapter on paleontological resource monitoring, defining what that is, we decided to pick a park, and that's Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, as our prototype park because of the dramatic changes in the lake level. And so we had fossil dinosaur track sites that part of the year they were underwater and part of the year they were above water levels. And we wanted to measure how those changes of water saturation and wave action and all those sort of things um, were, were acting on these resources to measure how quickly they were changing and deteriorating. And so here's, a, here's the first locality that we looked at. It's the Slick George Dinosaur Track Site. So there was 147 individual dinosaur tracks uh, in this particular uh, area. And you see that little red um, pencil-like thing. That's our photo point where we were able to look in all directions and take photos, repeat photography, and try to assess factors that may impact the, the fossils at this site. And so we had all kinds of things happening. The unit that was right below the dinosaur track bearing layer was a very soft sedimentary rock, and it eroded much more quickly than the than the uh, overlying uh, dinosaur producing unit. And so you get this undercutting that would create this uh, sort of conveyor belt effect where the leading edge of the overlying rock as it was undercut would drop off. And you know we would lose dinosaur tracks in the process. We put expansion cracks sort of like what architects use in old buildings to measure the rates of expansion and they were pretty rapid. We were below uh, very tall cliffs of Navajo sandstone where occasionally blocks would drop down and, and sometimes these are house size blocks and they were also impacting the site as well. Um, so here's just close up views on the left, a down drop block dr breaking off the dinosaur producing, dinosaur track producing layer. And then on the, the right hand side, you can see uh, these leading edges where, where the unit was getting undercut uh, would be dropping off. Uh, quite rapidly. And so here, using the photo point, we could look out and in the red circle, you can see some dinosaur tracks. On the blue arrow showed the current lake level. The red arrow shows the, the high water mark, which is clearly above the site, indicating that the site would be submerged periodically throughout the year. Um, that green was showing the undercutting, um, and the yellow shows the down drop blocks. And then this yellow circle shows something different. It's an area where we had documented that there were originally three dinosaur footprints there. And one year we came back and they were gone. And it didn't look like any sort of natural weathering and erosion. In fact, if you look at the end of these, where these arrows are, it shows chisel marks. And so some visitor came by and decided they wanted a souvenir. And so they chiseled this block out and took three dinosaur footprints uh, back from their, their vacation at Lake Powell. And so uh, through our monitoring efforts, it led to a discovery of a, a very important track locality that we're now publishing on. It's called the John Wesley Powell Fossil Track Block. Here, this large bipedal, Theropod dinosaur is the presumptive track maker. And, uh, and so that's going to be something that's going to be forthcoming, discovered during this monitor. Another closer to home example is that at George Washington Birthplace National Monument um, <clears throat> in Virginia, uh, we were helping the park monitor rapid erosion along the Potomac River. And because the area was hit with lots of storms and hurricanes like Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Isabel, it was resulting in very rapid erosion of these cliffs along the, along the waterway. And so we developed a monitoring protocol and taught the staff on how to go through and identify if there are fossils eroding out. And one of the law enforcement rangers of all people sent me an email and said, hey, Vince, I'm going to send you some photos. I found something that looks really interesting. Can you tell me if this is a fossil or not? 
And when he showed it to me, I could tell right away that it was the end of a snout of a long-nosed dolphin, a marine mammal from the Miocene. And so uh, we pulled together a team of, of experts, uh, some of our colleagues at the Calvert Marine Museum. And not only did we find a complete skull of one of these long-nosed dolphins that day, excavate it and bring it out to be prepared, but on our way back, we found a second one, again, complete skull. So we were rewarded with two um, Miocene age long-nosed dolphin skulls because of the monitoring. Same thing at, at Point Reyes National Seashore, uh, very rapidly eroding cliffs uh, in California. Uh, and so there was a, there was a small marine uh, mammal that was discovered, fossil, and that was collected as part of that monitoring exercise. One of the things that we use in, in, in our technology uh, for monitoring is photogrammetry. You're probably familiar with it. Uh, we are able to go out and do repeat photogrammetry where we get these 3D images where we're able to uh, see aspects on the surface of these rocks that are harder to see with the unaided eye. And we can use those to compare, take repeat photogrammetry and compare using software you know, year after year to show where there may be erosion or damage or other changes in these rock features um, by, by doing the sequential photography. So as, as we began this discussion, uh, Jerry was talking about National Fossil Day. A National Fossil Day was established in 2009. It was a partnership between the American Geosciences, Sciences, the National Science Foundation, the Smithsonian, and the National Park Service. And the idea was, you know, let's create one day where we can celebrate fossils. And so we had no idea that how, how successful this was going to turn out. Uh, but as I had mentioned, you know, we've got uh, over 430 partners across the country that are helping to celebrate us. And regardless of whether there's a, a pandemic or there is a government shutdown, that we have now such a constituency and followers for National Fossil Day that whether or not the government's open for business or not, all of our partners and colleagues uh, keep National Fossil Day going. So we think that, you know, this is going to continue into the future, and we're very proud of, of, of this partnership. You know, I, I think that uh, all of us that, that, that are interested in, in science education really know how valuable it is to get out and talk to kids, inspire them, and, and to uh, get them excited about science and learning. And fossils and, and, and other things like dinosaurs are a really effective way to get kids uh, hooked on, on science and learning. And so we have us all variety of programs. We have a junior paleontologist program uh, where kids can complete some exercise and they'll get a, a little junior paleontologist badge. The pa Paleontological Resource Preservation Act has one sentence in section 6303 uh, that says the secretary shall establish a program to increase public awareness about the significance of paleontological resources, slam dunk National Fossil Day. And why is it important to get that message out there? Um, back in the late 1990s, there was an unfortunate incident at a state park in Utah outside of Vernal, Utah, uh, called the Red Fleet State Park. It's an area where they had hundreds of dinosaur tracks exposed um, they had interpretation of that site. People would come uh, to this area because of boating and fishing and swimming and other recreational activities. And believe it or not, there was a weekend that there were some Boy Scouts that were there for an outing. And during time that uh, a number of these kids were left unsupervised, they came in and they ripped up a bunch of dinosaur tracks and started throwing them into the reservoir. And of course, other visitors were horrified and they took pictures and, and they got videos and, um, and they stopped the kids and reported them to the rangers. This case went on to a, uh, a case in, in Salt Lake City against the Boy Scouts, uh, the leaders and these children. And uh, it got a lot of national attention. So here you're seeing an editorial cartoon 
that was in the Salt Lake Tribune, but it, it, it caught the attention of media across the country. Even David Letterman, and uh, those of us that are old enough to remember David Letterman, he would have a top 10 list. And so there was a night on uh, David Letterman's top 10 list where he talked about the top 10 reasons not to leave your Boy Scouts unsupervised in the wilderness. So National Fossil Day, uh, again, we would never have anticipated the success of National Fossil Day. You know, again, those of us that work with kids realize that it doesn't matter the gender, it doesn't matter the race or uh, ethnic background. All kids have this affinity for dinosaurs and fossils. And so we wanna capture that and get them excited about science and learning and hopefully plant some seeds in, into their minds to want to learn more throughout their life. Um, one real quick note uh, that when we, the first year when we didn't know where National Fossil Day was gonna go, um, I happened to, to let our chief public information officer for the National Park Service, big wig guy. I mean, he's the voice of the National Park Service back at that time, know about this because I knew he had a geology background and he was really interested and he kept, emailing me every other week or so. Hey, let me know what's going on. Tell me the latest. Are you going to host an event? And so, you know, I was really appreciative that he really had this much interest, but he called me um, the, the Friday before National Fossil Day, which was held th that following Wednesday. We had a big event outside of the National Mall, outside on the National Mall with the Smithsonian and other partners. And he said, Vince, I'm going to try to be out there. I'm very busy but I want to be out there with you and, 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 and the public on National Fossil Day. So keep an eye out for me. So here we are on the National Mall. We've got like 500 kids ready to take the junior paleontologist pledge. And all of a sudden I hear a voice screaming in the background. It was somebody in a class A Park Service uniform waving his flat hat. And, and uh, as he approached, I saw it was, it was Dave, our public information officer. And he runs up to me fast and he's out of breath. And he said, Vince, you need to read this to these kids. And of course, the kids that are out there, they're inner city kids. Probably 50% of them were, were African-American kids. And they were Hispanic and Asian and Caucasian kids. And they were all out there. And so I didn't know what he was going to hand me. And he handed me exactly what you're seeing on the right. It was a presidential proclamation announcing National Fossil Day. And of course, all of us caught our breath. But when I read this to the, these kids and I said, sign President Obama, almost everybody instinctively, the teachers, the kids stood up and cheered. And we said, you know, we need to do this again next year. This is a lot of fun. And so with that said, we, we've been very rewarded. Each year we create a new, new annual logo. And, and in most cases, we try to pick something that's relatively unknown. So we're not creating just the T-Rex and a trilobite. We try to find things that are look prehistoric, but a lot of people aren't familiar with them. So for example, the first one on the upper left-hand side is a titanothere from the Badlands. And so, you know, you show that to people and they look at it and they're interested. And what do they ask? What is that? And that's the hook, you know, to engage in the conversation so that they can learn. There's a whole world of living things that have come and gone not just the dinosaurs. And you know, we, we're, we're trying to educate through the use of these logos to expand people's understanding of this wonderful world that existed before, before we took over. Uh, we have one of our volunteers that create these beautiful fossil education kits. Um, he does this at his own dime and at his own expense. And uh, these kits are just incredible. He's designed and customized them for about 27 different national parks. And so rangers are able to use those to engage kids um, through this very generous effort. And finally, we, uh, we created coloring books. We have these prehistoric life in the national parks coloring books, which allow kids then to learn and to enjoy uh, mm -hmm. the, these resources that are available by the National Park Service. So with that said, I, I, I wanted to thank you all for your time and thank Jerry especially for the opportunity to meet with you. If you ever have any questions, um, my email is at the bottom. I'm, I'm happy to, to correspond with, with you and, and see if you have any questions. And if you 
ever find a national park that we don't know already has fossils? If you help us to identify a new one, I've got a special award that I give to people that can help us to identify new <laughs> national parks with fossils. With that said, I'll I'll keep quiet. <laughs> oh man, that was uh, that's above my expectations there, Vince, for your program. And uh, I think we need to do a Zoom rock room bus trip this summer <laughs> to these sites, huh? And uh, uh, boy, uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm still blown away by the by the uh, mummified bats at Grand Canyon. That's <laughs> something I never heard of. Yeah, we were too. All right, uh, let's turn to the chat room. Anybody have any questions uh, for Vint? Put them on in there. We had that wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Is somebody able to read those for me or? Yeah, I believe Mel will, will do it for you, right, Mel? Yep, I'm looking for them. They're just a bunch of thank yous and wonderful jobs at this point. Thanks. And for questions now, but all of them are where you were terrific. Thank you. So are there any plans to uh, do a preservation of the uh, foot tracks on the bridge at Gaysburg? So that's a good question. And, and, and many of you probably know the history of those footprints. They were, uh, they were put into the capstone on the stone bridges uh, above Plum Run along South Confederate Avenue. It was a decision that was intentionally made. Uh, they didn't plan it from the beginning, but when they had quarried uh, these rocks that were gonna be incorporated into the stone bridge during the 1930s, um, that they found at the locality in York Springs, uh, there were these Triassic age footprints of dinosaurs and other reptiles. And so it led to a discussion uh, amongst the uh, project coordinator, supervisor, um, the, the engineer and design architect that designed the bridge and the national park superintendent at Gettysburg National Military Park. They said, what do we do with these? these they have dinosaur footprints. So they sent some to the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian took a few of those, and the decision was that they were going to incorporate some of them on the on the capstone on each side of the bridge, which they exist today. Now they're deteriorating because you know they're exposed to Mother Nature and and natural things happen. Occasionally, we'll find that somebody comes in there and they pour plaster on it and they they try to take a, a replica of it, which is is not appropriate because it leads to, to issues. If there's cracks in these blocks, that, that liquid plaster impregnates it or gets fills these cracks. And when they pull it out, then it starts to damage the rock. And if it happens too much, it'll lead to you know, impairment of these, of these very rare and special resources. So, so what we've done is to answer your question, We've done photogrammetry of all of them. So we now have 3D models and, um, you know, hopefully we never have to do it, but if we had to replace that block, we could theoretically 3D print the exact same block with the same tracks in it. It wouldn't be the original stone, but we could replace it if for some reason it's ever damaged or, or it needs to be replaced, so. Okay. All right, so there is one question uh, in the chat. They asked, are the paleo reports from the National Park Service available online? Yes, they are. And so um, I, Jerry has my email. Um, and at the bottom of my email, he, he's, he, he's certainly welcome to share it with you. At the bottom of my email is a link that includes um, a list of all of my publications. Most of them have hyperlinks where you can uh, actually go ahead and upload that publication directly. Uh, but if you're not finding so anything and, you, and you're interested in something, again, feel free to email me and I can send you a, a digital PDF of, of any of those publications. I will send that out uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Yep. Okay. You'll find them surprisingly interesting.
I believe that's how I got to know you first was by your uh, article you did on the, the Gettysburg Bridge, um, whenever that was early on in the 2000s. Yes. All right. Um, Those were all the questions from the chat. Excellent. Well, I, I just want to, once again, Gary, thank you for the opportunity. Melanie, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I'm happy to help to try to round up some other speakers for you in the future if you ever uh, Want, want to talk more national park geology, I would encourage you to Google uh, National Park Service Geology and National Park Service Paleontology because it'll take, it, take you to some of our national park websites. And um, I, I have to admit, the person who works on those for us does a really great job. Um, he just updated all of our uh, volcanology web pages. And so, you know, you can spend hours looking through uh, the various pages that are available there. Oh, okay. All right. Well, again, I want to want to thank you, Vince, and good to see you again. Maybe we can see uh, each other in person sometime here down the road, not too far away. Look forward to it. And uh, thanks again. Um, I did want to uh, say a little bit about uh, what happened yesterday over in Turkey and Syria. I'm sure everybody heard that there was a major earthquake, uh, 7.8. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay, Vince. We'll see you. Thank you. See yep. ya. Thanks so much, Vince. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye. Yep. Excellent. So, yeah, the 7.8 uh, Turkey uh, earthquake, and uh, last number I heard was that they're up to uh, 7,200 people killed. Uh, I think there's 10 towns that have been uh, um, destroyed, basically. And this is a uh, a fault that's very, very similar to the San Andreas fault, where um, Arabia is moving up along with the uh, uh, Turkey, and they're, they're actually slotting past each other. Again, very similar to what's going on at Saint San Andreas Fault. Uh, so it was not it was not unexpected that there was going to be a major earthquake in that zone because there had not been a major earthquake there for many many years. So that's what we call a a seismic gap. We don't have a major earthquake for a while. That becomes a high potential area that could have a, a devastating earthquake. So it, it didn't catch the seismologists over there off guard. So we just uh, keep keep all those people and the rescue people that are being flown in from around the world to uh, keep them in your prayers at um, uh, recovery and uh, rebuilding will, will take place. Also, uh, one more announcement, and then I'll turn it over to, to my buddy Mel there. Um, if you're still looking for the Green Comet, you are running out of time. Uh, it's going away from us. It's getting dimmer. Uh, I did see it last night uh, with binoculars as a uh, fuzz ball. But if you have a clear night sometime, <laughs> uh, I don't think I think it's going to be cloudy across the state tonight. But if you have a clear night in the next uh, three, four nights, uh, when you go outside, look straight up. And then there's a bright star will be directly over your head. That's called Capella. And over to your right is going to be in a, a very pretty bright red star. That's actually Mars. Uh, tonight, for example, if you draw a line from Capella to Mars, the comet's about a third of the way to the right of the bright star toward Mars. Now, by Friday night, uh, if you put Mars in a pair of binoculars and look just to the left of Mars, you're going to see the comet. It's going to be just to its left. And Saturday night, the comet's going to move down and a little bit to the right of Mars. 
So you have two good nights, and the weather is a little iffy for Friday night because we're doing a uh, we're doing a comet watch at Cadora State Park in Hanover Friday night uh, from, from six until eight. Uh, the weather sounds uh, not good because it's supposed to rain Saturday. But anyway, the green comet is on its way out. Magnitude now is uh, eight point two. So it's obviously not a naked eye object any longer. Uh, binoculars, yes. But uh, try to catch it within the next week if you want to. Okay. Uh, that's all my announcements. I really didn't I really didn't say hi to Mel at the beginning of the show. So Mel, hello and good to see you up and around uh, after <laughs> three weeks ago. Well. You were you were uh you weren't feeling real well. So a couple weeks ago, but we're doing good. Good, good. So appreciate you being here and uh, of course and doing all your fun stuff. And speaking of fun stuff, like like Mel said, our next episode in two weeks is a big one. And we, uh, Mel and I, have already talked about some cool stuff that we're going to do, trying to figure out a way to send everybody a piece of anniversary cake. I'm mm -hmm. not sure how to do that yet, but. Uh, but anyway, we're going to have some fun things to do before the program with uh, Roger Freed, uh, who's not, I don't think he's in the room tonight. But uh, anyway, uh, two weeks. Invite your friends to come along. Uh, we want to we want to have a nice big crowd for our 100th episode. And on, on with that, I'm going to pass over to Mel. I think she had a little joke for you too. But uh, and uh, you can take us out of here. Yeah, sure thing. So you started with a few jokes. So my only joke for the night was, uh, what do you call a paleontologist who naps on the job? <laughs> Don't know. Lazy bones. <laughs> um, um, but thank before you, you. Before you go, where was that link of publications that Vince mentioned? I'm going to send it to you. I'll email to you. Alrighty. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight and we will see you all uh, in the next two weeks for that 100th episode. All right, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Mel. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll see you. See you, Jerry. We'll see you there, Dick. <laughs> Made it. <laughs> I saw that. Good job. Take care.